Good evening, Facebook world. This is Tony Montcalm, the Communications Manager for Tenor Health System. We're coming to you live from Operating Suite Number 2 at Tenor Medical Center, Villa Rica. This ex ex was part of an expansion that opened in 2018, the end of the year, and dramatically increased the surgical capacity for this hospital. I'm joined this evening with Dr. Jose Espinel, a board-certified surgeon with Carrollton Surgical Group and a member of the medical staff at Tenor Health System and one of our in-house heartburn specialists, Dr. Espinel. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you for making time for us this evening. Tony, first of all, thank you very much for putting all this together. I'm excited about Facebook Live here with Tanner. We are too, because it's the first time that we've done it, so be patient, be <laughs> gentle. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us about your training. Sure, Tony. So I am a board-certified surgeon. I did my medical school in Guayaquil, Ecuador. Then I came to the United States and did uh, general surgery training at St. Barnum's Medical Center in Livingston, New Jersey for five years. And then I pursued a fellowship in minimally invasive surgery in Springfield, Massachusetts. And now, now I am part of Carlton Surgical Group and I'm here as medical staff for Tanner Health System. Fantastic, yeah. awesome. So I guess the, one of the first questions we need to get out of the way is the elephant in the OR. <laughs> You're a surgeon and yes. we're here to talk about heartburn. So what's the connection between heartburn and surgery? Well, the connection is that the ultimate treatment for heartburn is surgery. So that's how surgeons get connected to the disease. And how prevalent is heartburn? How many people have this? So it's estimated that around probably 30% of uh, people in the United States that suffer from heartburn. So you, you can make the math, right? 325 million, 350 million people, 30%, you're talking about probably around 100 million people in the United States, they suffer from uh, reflux disease. I am definitely one of those statistics. <laughs> um, so what causes it? Why do people have this? What leads to this? So what I try to explain to my patients is that heartburn is really a mechanical problem, okay? And I, to, to go into depth and to understand reflux, I have to talk a little bit about how your digestive system works, right? So you, you get the food in your mouth, you chew it, and then the food goes down through this long muscular tube called the esophagus. Uh, I call it the food pipe, so people can understand. Okay, food, food goes down food pipe. Yep. I'm following. Yep, so All the right. food pipe basically connects the mouth with the stomach. Now the stomach is the grinder of the body, mm -hmm. right? It makes that food, that pieces, chunk of food into baby food consistency. The issue is that the stomach is not a mechanical grinder, it's a chemical grinder. So it makes that digestion of the food through acid hydrochloric acid, very potent acid. So once you understand that, what happens is at the end of the food pipe, the esophagus, beginning of the stomach, the fibers of muscles that we have there, they have a special arrangement, right? And they create a valve, right? It's called the lower esophageal sphincter. Fancy name to make a valve. Right. And what the job of that valve is, is to open up when the food goes down, mm -hmm. And when the food's in the stomach to get digested, to get grinded, it should close up tight so the acid doesn't go from the stomach into the food pipe, into the esophagus. If that valve is weak, mm -hmm. right, that's when we call it that the patient has an incompetent lower esophageal sphincter, an incompetent valve. I've been called incompetent before, exactly. I guess. Exactly. Sure. So then the acid is going to go from the stomach into the food pipe, mm -hmm. and you're going to have all the symptoms of reflux. Okay, that's, okay. that's basically what happens. So it's when the acid gets when the acid shouldn't be. Exactly, when the acid gets into the place that it should not be. Now, there are other uh, issues, or there's other problems that can cause this valve to relax, right? Not only mechanically one, the other one, there are some foods that they relax the muscle. For example, caffeine, alcohol relaxes you, uh, carbonated drinks, uh, chocolate, peppermint. So those things relax. There's some medications that relax the muscles. Muscle relaxants, people take medications for you know, contracted muscles. Right. Uh, benzodiazepines, that medications that for people who have a lot of anxiety mm -hmm. that relax you, antidepressants. So there's other factors too that makes that valve to be weak. 
I see. So are there any behaviors that exacerbate heartburn or cause heartburn? Is there something that, that people who have it periodically should be doing differently? Sure. So, so there are some things that, like I just told you, right? There's some foods that can exacerbate that muscle to get relaxed. So if you love to eat chocolate and you love to eat spicy food, if you love to drink some alcohol, uh, those should be in, you know, in, the, in the back place in your, in your eating habits, right? That's like uh, the base of my food pyramid, though. That's, <laughs> that's right. And we all do. We all that's do. where other people have grain. Right. I mean, I, that's what I do. You know, on the weekends, you don't drink a little bit of wine and dinner, uh, you know, for dessert, you have a chocolate. And that's why usually at, on the weekends, it's very common at night. Mm -hmm. You get down, you get your reflux. Um, other things are um, weight. You know, if you gain too much weight, you're going to put pressure on your belly and you're going to put pressure on that valve. Mm -hmm. Squeeze uh, it open. Squeeze it open. You know, pregnancy. You know, pregnant women, they suffer a lot of reflux. Uh, other things are tight clothes. Some women like to use a lot of tight clothes. So that's going to put pressure on your belly. The scrubs that I'm wearing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and other things, for example, uh, eating late at night mm -hmm. and going directly to bed. They recommend that you should not, you sh your last meal at night should be probably three to four hours before you lay flat. So you can do those changes and it should help some of the reflux. Right. So some people, if I don't take my pill every night, I know it the next morning. My wife, she's got a bottle. She keeps it by the sink. She takes it every now and then. She'll go in it for a week. She'll stop for a week or she gets something. She pops a couple of antacids. She's fine. So what is sort of, is there, is there a line of demarcation between what makes this occasional and what makes this like GERD? What makes this a serious disease? Right. So, I mean, there's, there's not a number of one said, okay, if I do suffer symptoms of reflux twice a week, then it's bad. Basically, if the disease, right, in this, in this case, reflux, mm -hmm. affects your daily living, that's when I believe that you should consider changing your lifestyle, adding medication, and at one point in time, thinking about surgery. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I want to go ahead and get into some of the questions that we had submitted uh, through our online forum uh, before our, our broadcast. Uh, we had a question from Maya from Carrollton, and she wants to know what is the first thing that people should do to treat their chronic heartburn? So we've just kind of been talking about it, right? Mm -hmm. if, if you suffer from chronic reflux, uh, let, let me start there. I, I, I want to jump a little into her questions. Sure. First thing is, what are the symptoms of reflux? We're jumping into, yeah. we're missing that, right? Yeah. To answer her question. So reflux symptoms are, has a lot of variety, right? The classic ones are heartburn. You feel burning sensation usually in this part of your belly. Mm -hmm. You have a regurgitation. When, that's the sensation that you feel the acid coming all the way you to your this, mouth. You get the yes. in the back yeah. of your mouth. Water bash, they yeah. call it. It'll yeah. just go all the way here. Yeah. Thanks. You can have taste chest pain. People feel tightness in here. That's another symptom. The other one is called dysphagia. Dysphagia is difficulty swallowing. You get so much irritation there that the food has a difficulty time in going through it through the food pot. Mm -hmm. uh, the other symptoms could have, those are the GI gastrointestinal symptoms. Then you have something that we call the laryngeal symptoms, okay, which are basically coughing so that if the acid goes into your air air pipe now, not mm -hmm. your food pipe, your air pipe, you're going to be having some, <coughs> you start feeling people having, I have something in my throat all the time. Mm -hmm. And that can, that can get you to, lead you to hoarseness, get people start talking like that, you know, because the acid going all the time. People have pneumonias. They can have, they can be diagnosed with anemia because you develop ulcers there and you're bleeding a drop a day. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are the symptoms, right? So just trying to get there. So the question again was what you should do, uh, the first thing that people should do when they have the symptoms. So if you're having the symptoms, obviously the first thing to do is you have to get into diagnosis, mm -hmm. right? What do you have it? Because, you know, coughing could be from a lot of things. But if you've been diagnosed with reflux disease, so say your doctor said, yeah, you do have reflux disease because it seems like you have the symptoms. You can start with changing what we talked, the eating habits, lifestyle, losing a little bit of weight, eating a little bit earlier, not going to bed right away after you eat, uh, you can start taking some medications over the counter. You know, we've got Tums, Rolaids, and things like that uh, to see if you improve with that, right? Mm -hmm. And then you start, there's also medications over the counter. We're going to be talking about it called protonous, proton pump inhibitors. They're coming for PPI. Uh, so 
those medications, there are some PPIs that you can get without any prescriptions, you know, the purple pill, Nexium, mm -hmm. right? You can get right. it, you can take that and see that improve. I mean, that's how you should start. Awesome. Well, I want to remind everyone that if you do have any questions, you're welcome to ask them during our live broadcast. You can leave your questions right down here and we'll get to them. Or if you're seeing this after the live broadcast, feel free to leave your questions. We'll route them to Dr. Espinel and make sure that we get back with you with what you need to know. So uh, I'm going to keep rolling then. Uh, we've got Davis from Hiram, and he asked the obvious question we did too. Why is a surgeon talking about heartburn? When do we get to the point that we're looking at a surgical solution for heartburn? Okay, that's a pretty broad question, and I'm going to take a little bit of time in here, but um, why a surgeon is talking about heartburn, I just mentioned it to you. Sure. It's a mechanical problem, right? It's a mechanical problem that it can only be fixed with surgery. So there's no magic pill that I can give you that is gonna make that incompetent valve competent. Right, no right? pill is gonna make me competent. No, I got no it. pill is gonna make you competent. I've been told. <laughs> so um, how did it all start? It starts where you're gonna see your primary care doctor, put you on mm -hmm. some medication. This is the kind of like common pathway, right? Put you on medication. Uh, your symptoms sometimes will get better, sometimes will not get better. Statistics says that 40% of people who suffer from reflux disease, they're going to be unhappy with medication. That means that the medication is not going to work, right? So that 40% of people who are not improving with medication, they should go the next step. The next step will be, I believe that they should be evaluated by a gastroenterologist, which are the doctors that, you know, Digestive the, the health clinical doctors, doctors right. that see reflux disease. Because you start going into, okay, medication's not working, what's happening? So you have to go through a bunch of tests to be done to see why it's not working. And this is called basically medical refractory reflux disease. That means medication's not working, it's refractory to it. That's when you start thinking, okay, let's go into surgery you know, to answer the question there. Awesome. And I just, we're in the OR, we've got these tools back here. What are our surgical solutions? What, what is going to work for most patients? So if we're going directly to surgery, um, basically we have to recreate a new valve. That's the, the, the job that a surgeon is going to do. And there are basically two ways. There's, there's several ways, you know, I'm not going to, I don't want to get into technicalities. Um, you can do this, you can do that. But in general, just to have the gross idea, there's two ways to create a valve nowadays. One is you create the valve with your own stomach. Okay. So okay. through surgery, through little incisions nowadays with the use of the robot mm -hmm. that we have here behind, that we have it here in, at Villa Rica, Tanner. We do little incisions, we go in there and we wrap your, your own stomach around the, asap, the food pipe at the end. Okay, so you wrap it around, you put sutures, and you create a new valve. That's what is called fundoplication. People mm -hmm. talk about it, oh, I had a fundoplication, I'm gonna have a fundoplication. The second option is what we call a uh, magnetic sphincter augmentation device. The, the name out there, the commercial name is called LINX, L-I-N-X. You can get into the website if you want. I'm gonna, I have one here. The LINX, what it is, is magnetic beads. Okay, I'm gonna open this and see if we can show it. They come like this, right? They're magnetic beads. So you can see there, it stretches. They stretch it and then you let them go, they're gonna come together because they're magnetic. Mm -hmm. And what we do surgically is we create a window where the weak sphincter is and then we wrap it around it, right? Uh -huh. um, they're different sizes because we have different sizes of esophagus. And when the person, so it's basically a new belt, right? You have loose pants, you sure. fall off. This is, this is the belt for the esophagus, right? So you eat, the food, will, this will expand, the food will come in, and you stop eating, it comes back, it'll make your sphincter, your Pretty valve smart. tight. Those are basically the two options surgically that you have right now to fix uh, reflux disease. What are some of the advantages and disadvantages to the to the the fun you were talking about with the wrapping your stomach around itself fundoplication 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 hey i got closer than i thought i would so what are the advantages yeah what, are, what it, it's prevalent right and so it's something that a lot of people have done for surgery but what are some of the disadvantages what 
So what this, comes back to it? Right. So the, the advantages of fund application is you have a new valve. So your symptoms should, you know, they, they'll improve. Your mm -hmm. regurgitation that you have in the middle of the night, that you're waking up, that you're choking, um, the heartburn sensation, all those symptoms should get better, mm -hmm. right? Um, if you're trying to ask me about what is the advantage from a fund application and a, and a Lynx procedure, one of the advantages that I tell patients or that you have is that the Lynx, because they have magnetic beads, you can mm -hmm. actually open and close all the time. Those patients tend to be able to belch more. If you create a valve, a fund application with your own stomach, mm -hmm. it's a rigid valve, right? So they're gonna, those patients are going to have a harder time to belch and vomit. They're going to have more bloating, right? Because the air that you swallow can't come north as it goes right. south, right? So people have a lot of bloating and a lot of flatulence. They can pay for the fund application. With the, with the links, you don't, right? Because this opens and closes, you can burp and things like that. The other disadvantage that I will say about fund application is that the lifespan of a fund application that is going to work mm -hmm. is between good and tight. 10, yeah, getting tight. Good and 10 tight. to 15 years. Uh, it's a wear and tear, right? It's just like our skin wrinkles and, mm -hmm. you know, it's Talking organic material hair. and right. it's going to decay. So, so, right. gonna, so basically a person has a fund application, you can guarantee that they're going to have a revisional surgery around 15 years from the fund application. The length is titanium, right? Right. No wear and tear. Right. So. And when I get close to the fridge, is the length going to suck <laughs> me to the... <laughs> it's, I can still, I can still uh, have an MRI. I can still go through airport now security. I, go through I that, can, I Yes. It. Yes, yes. So, yes. so MRIs... In, in the magnet for, for the links for the magnetic, magnetic beads, what it's going to do is it's going to demagnetize them. So if you get an MRI and you have the links, it's going to stop working. So that's the disadvantage. The advantage for me is you come back and I'll get you a new one, mm. right? Yeah. But uh, anyway, <laughs> but the good, the good news is that uh, the links is compatible with 75% of the MRIs in the United States. Uh, the the more, the newer versions of MRI, those are the ones who demagnetize the MRI. So anybody who gets a Lynx is gonna get a little card, implant card, mm -hmm. and you have a number where you can call and they'll let you know if you can get your MRI or not. Oh, great. All right. And we do the surgery minimally invasively, but even arguably robotically. That doesn't necessarily mean that we let you lay down and the robot just sort of goes and, and does it. You can kind of point back here and show us what what this is a little bit? Sure, sure. So uh, all the surgeries that we do, because I still do fund applications. Actually, the majority of my cases, I do fund applications. Not everybody can get a Lynx, right? So some people are so, already so, had a fund application. Right, so, exactly. So, so, or people have big parasophageal hernias, that means the stomach and the chest. They're not the best candidate for a Lynx. But anyway, um, regardless of what procedure you get for reflux, the way that we're doing it now is a bit of incision surgery. It's minimally invasive surgery. Right? Well, Instead big, of making a big cut. How big is my cut? So the cuts are, I tell patients, the width of my pinky. And you get four or five of those. Okay. And now with the latest technology that we have in, in the surgical field is the robotic uh, surgery, the Da Vinci. Mm -hmm. Right. The advantage of the Da Vinci that I'm going to kind of show you a little bit here is you can do more precise operation. Why? Because the camera of the robot it's actually two cameras in one. Uh, the difference from laparoscopy, which is just one camera. Right. So with a robot, you actually have depth perception that you don't have a laparoscopy. That's number one. Number two is the instruments that we use. I'll show you one right here. Okay. So this is the instruments that we use. This is a, a needle driver, right? If you look at this, this is the tip of the instrument. Look at that. That's what's in there. That's what it is. And it look look how it moves. I'm, oh. I'm rotating everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. This instrument, the tip of this instrument, they can articulate more than the human wrist. Just like that. So, in other words, it's like me putting my hands in your belly and do the operation. Right? So, that's an advantage. It, look at that. Superhuman dexterity. Exactly. Superhuman dexterity. So, I'm just going to leave that one right here. Sure. So, that's another advantage of the robot. The other advantage of the robot is if you look back over there with that chair is right there, that is the console, right? Mm -hmm. So I sit in that console and through this joysticks that you can see back over there, 
I put my fingers and I control this arms how they move. Uh, top in that top part of the console, I put my forehead in there. That top part is the screen. So I have the screen. You got your hands and the joysticks. You're manipulating this arms. Uh, so ergonomics. I'm sitting down doing an operation that lasts, you know, two three hours. I think some operations last even more. And I'm comfortably sitting down there with a, like I told you, a, yeah. a, a 3D mm -hmm. view. A high grade, with, a high grade Atari. That's what we <laughs> <laughs> I, I, Atari was my time. So yeah, 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 all right. Combat. Yeah. Yep. Combat. Yep. 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 River so, Run. So, so, so. <laughs> River Run. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. yeah, that's that's how we're doing it. Awesome. So you're getting really small incisions. Yes. You're dealing with less blood loss because you're not making a huge cut. You're dealing with yes. less scarring. Yes. You're having a more comfortable recovery, right? It's Absolutely. All of this, and this is not only for the robot, but for minimally invasive surgery, the advantages are... Uh, Faster return to activities daily living. That means go, you go return to work faster. Uh, cosmetic, mm -hmm. um, less chances of wound infection because you're making little incisions. Less chances to develop a hernia, right? Hernia right. is basically you put sutures and it breaks apart. Uh, less chance for that. And, uh, and, and like we talked about ergonomics. It's a, it's a big talk about how surgeons and we're standing in there for hours and doing the laparoscopy yeah. and moving like that. We're having carpal tunnels. We're having you know shoulder problems, elbows problems. So it's an advantage for everybody. Absolutely. Fantastic. So back to some of the questions we've been getting. And remember too, if you have your own question, ask it below. We'll get to you. Uh, in fact, we just had one come in. Dewan had his gallbladder out a year ago and is still having pain. Not exactly a heartburn question, but what should he do? Yeah, not, it's not a heartburn question, uh, but I'm going to try to get something harboring from that question but yeah. if the patient if, if somebody has go about out and you still have pain you should go back to the surgeon who did the operation and he that person will do more testing to figure out what else it could be okay what's you know i don't know how long ago how, well, a year ago could be something else could be an ulcer in the stomach because sometimes ulcers in the stomach can cause pain really. but with that question what i can tell you though is that a lot of the symptoms of gallbladder disease can be related to the reflux disease, so the harbor, indigestion, I'm feeling bad. Something that is very common that we see is, oh, person is gallbladder, they get the gallbladder out and they still have the symptoms. And when you dig a little bit more, you figure out, oh, the patient had reflux as well. It's not that their gallbladder was not sick, but the patient also has some reflux disease. So right. gallbladder and reflux, there. Right. they're very, very similar symptoms. I see. And one of the uh, issues too with with heartburn for me that i don't think a lot of people realize is that when you have this for a long time it can lead to other health problems right oh absolutely so what are some of the the complications that are going to happen down the road if heartburn yeah. and GERD go untreated yeah i don't know if that was a question for somebody but i'm telling you that is a very important question so um the natural history of reflux disease right so when this starts and can end uh, it starts with some inflammation in the inner lining of your esophagus, of the food pipe at the end, mm -hmm. okay? It's called esophagitis. The next step to that is that you can develop some strictures. Because remember, it's acid coming out of the food pipe. So if the lumen of your food pipe is that, after burning and burning and burning, it can get very tight and have difficulty swallowing. Mm -hmm. The other complication that reflux can have in the long-term complications is something called Barrett's esophagus, B-A-R-R-E-T-T, -T, esophagus. I'm gonna to try to make it very simple like I explain my patients as well, I'll try to make it very simple. The inner lining of the esophagus, okay, it should have a specific type of uh, lining in there, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, if you put acid, acid, and acid all the time, it's gonna change the lining in there, okay? And that's what is called Barrett's esophagus. It's a microscopic diagnosis, that means the gastroenterologists, surgeons are going to go down in there, they're going to take a piece of the inner lining of your food pipe or the esophagus mm -hmm. and send it to the microscope. Biopsy. And, and then make it biopsy. Mm -hmm. And then going to look at the microscope and say, oh, this is Barrett's esophagus. Now, we can see when we're doing the procedure, say, oh, this looks like Barrett's because we know how it looks. Um, why Barrett's is so important? And then the way that I try to explain to patients is like if you're having to remodel your floor, mm -hmm. right? And you have your tiles very nice. What happens if you take the towels out? It's going to get rough, 
right? And you can have an accident, right? It's going to be rough until you clean it up again and put your tiles. Back. That's basically Barrett's. Barrett's is your floor without tiles. Not good. Mm -hmm. Raw. 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 Exactly. So Barrett's, why it's so important is because it has 40% increase in risk to develop esophageal cancer, which is the last this wheel is. of the natural history of reflux that you don't want to get to it. Mm -hmm. Cancer, esophageal cancer. In the United States, esophageal cancer has risen 700% because of reflux. This, uh, let me rephrase this. Has risen 700% of esophageal cancer related to reflux. Esophageal cancer in the past it was very common in who? In the smokers and the alcoholics. Those are the risk factors. Right. So that's another type of esophageal cancer, not related to barriers, mm -hmm. right? But now esophageal cancer has risen 700%. So why? You know, people are actually in the United States smoking a little bit less. You know, alcohol has become, you know, don't drink too much. And then we have learned that it's because of barriers. So don't get there. That's what I tell right. patients. You know, don't, don't, don't wait until then. It's a silent disease. Well, now we know. Now we know. So some of the more questions that have come in. Um, Anna from West Georgia asked, what can I do to help my heart burn? I've always taken bottles of antacids and they help some, but not always. What can I do besides just taking the over-the-counter antacids? We've just been talking about it, right? I mean, over-the-counters are medications that are going to be the least helpful. Mm -hmm. um, she definitely can go and try some uh, other medications that treat uh, reflux. They're basically the two major groups that we have are what we call the PPIs, they're called proton pulse inhibitors. There's one over the, you know, over the counter, no prescriptions, Nexium. And then we have what we call the H2 blockers, you know, Santac, that right now lately was taken out of the market because it was mm -hmm. related to carcinogen. So there are ranitidines uh, and famotidine that you can take that instead of the Santac is ranitidine. So you can take famotidine now and take that. So there's two medications, but in her case, what I would li definitely recommend is, listen, you've been taking medication so long, it's not working. We just talked about it. Mm -hmm. I will recommend see a gastroenterologist, go and be evaluated by the gastroenterologist. Let them do some other testing, you know? We don't want to have barriers, you know, especially if she's been having the reef for so long. Mm -hmm. And uh, Chris from Whitesburg wanted to know if there are any risks from taking heartburn pills for a long time. Very interesting question. Yeah. Very, uh, very. It's, it's been... I'm pretty sure that the reason why she's asking this is because it's been in the news for the last five years at least. Uh, does, and we're talking about basically prompt pun inhibitors. So I'm gonna call it PPIs to make okay. it short. Heartburn. So pills. yeah, so P PPIs, they cause um, Alzheimer's, they cause kidney disease, that they cause, um, I talk about Alzheimer's, uh, what is the other thing that they talk a lot about? If more infections, if they cause, I think that's basically the ones that are pretty, 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 pretty big on it. The, the, the answer for that is to, to, to people, you know, so, so they're calm. There's been a bunch of studies out there. None of those studies has been, and I'm going to talk to medical terminology, statistics, that mm -hmm. has not been a uh, randomized uh, trials testing saying that blinded, blinded randomized trials that will say, yes, PPIs cause this and cancer and all these things they're talking about. What they've done in the studies is they get, just to put it very simple, okay, who has Alzheimer's? Then you got 100 people. Well, who's taking PPIs? 90% of the Alzheimer's people. Oh, now PPI is related to Alzheimer's. That's, that's kind of basically what's been going out there. Um, so the studies themselves are The suspect. studies are, yeah, there's some of them that are being a little more better done. Mm -hmm. And the ones that we really, really had done a lot of studies is patients if they have developed pneumonias in the hospital while they're taking medications for for reflux and there is a slight increase so the recommendation is not oh they're going to cause you pneumonias you know use it with care you know be, be conscious about it and the other thing is it's been related to an infection called uh Clostridium difficile diarrhea, a special diarrhea caused by a specific bacteria. I love it when the conversation the, takes us turn. Yes, yes. I try not to get it. It does that with me more often but there, than I would There's think. a relationship between <laughs> PPIs and this bacteria that can cause you diarrhea. Uh -huh. There's a relationship. Let me just tell, reinforce it. It's not that it causes 100%. So they say use it with caution. So to answer that question, is, right now there's nothing set in stone that these medications are going to cause harm in the long term. 
Makes sense. But if you are worried about it, you can get a surgery and you get it fixed. Yes. So, oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, we had a question come in from Tina over Facebook. She only has reflux in the middle of the night. Why would she only have reflux in the middle of the night? Well, once again, it would be interesting to tell her right now what time is her last meal? You know, uh, what was your meal? Mm -hmm. uh, what is her weight? You know, there's a lot of things that are going on, but I can tell you though, it's not nice to ask about the weight. Yeah, I know, I know. But, <laughs> but, but, but if she has symptoms just at night, it could be that that's the way her disease is presented. Uh -huh. Everybody presents it different, right? Uh, also, because when you're when you're laying back, right, the gravity is going to sure. cause the compression on the the sphincter we were talking sure. about. Sure. So you lay, it's, you know, you're in supine position, laying flat. Gravity is going to push in there. If you, you know, I, you know I'm going to share something with, with you guys. You know, if, if I I'm a little overweight. No. Um, no. And, yes, yes. But listen, yeah, I'm overweight. My BMI is not where it's supposed to be, so I'm overweight. Um, and if I go out and eat, for example, Chinese food that I like, and I drink a couple of beers of that, and I eat, let's say that it was a social event, so we go and eat at 8 o'clock at night. We finish eating at 9. We're there. I get home, 10.30, go to bed. You think it's going to happen? I'm going to have reflux. I mean, I know that. So what I've been doing is... I sleep in the recliner, and that's how I fix my reflux. But I have that on those specific times. You know, I don't have reflux every day, so I know how to handle it, right? I'm trying to work on my weight. I'm trying to not eat too much at night and try If I eat at night, try not to get those two or three beers that I drink. And uh, I mean, that's the way that you handle it. Sometimes I also sleep in the recliner, but it's because I forgot to get the laundry out of the dryer. <laughs> Jean says, I have Barrett's esophagus and have had four ablations. Can I have links if I meet the requirements? Well, the questions are getting more technical. And I right? like them. I like yeah. them. Yeah, yes, yes, challenging. Yes. So, so what are, uh, what's his name? Jean, right? Jean, so, so to answer your question, um, you're doing the right thing. Once you develop a... Uh, Barrett's, which we talked about is a precursor of cancer, you want to get there. The treatment for that is what we call ablation. Gastroenterologists do that. Basically, they burn the inside lining of the esophagus to burn the Barrett cells, and they'll slough away. And those ablations require usually at least two sessions. So it's not one burn, you're going to be cured from Barrett's. You need at least two burns, if not three. So you need several sessions. And once you get rid of all the Barrett's, then you got to be sure that you stay on your medication because the PPI is going to do is decrease the acid production. So less acid is going to go up, so less chance for that burning in your inner lining. But you're definitely a candidate to do the next step. Mm -hmm. And if I do be you, Gene, I will go ahead, okay, I have been on medication, and it, even with medications, I get Barrett's. Or I got cured of my Barrett's, but then I have to stay on medication for the rest of my life. I'm already in that pathway. Mm -hmm. I want to avoid that. We just talked about it. The answer is get a new valve. You got to get a new valve to prevent that acid to come back again so you, you don't develop uh, uh, Barrett's. Then the question is, can you be a candidate for links? Yes, I mean, it depends. You know, it's not only about, there's several things about the links. And I'll tell you just upfront things. Uh, you have to be over 18, uh, no previous uh, surgery in the hiatus. That means no previous fundoplication, in other words. Um, and your BMI, which is your body max index, has to be less than 35. So people with BMIs more than 35, they're not a candidate for the links. And that's that's, that's kind of like the... And the other thing, uh, obviously, you have to good, have a good motility of your food pipe. Your soft has to be able to squeeze strong. So there's some testings that we do to confirm that. But that's kind of the, the capsule right there. Um, so one of the other questions that came in before... Um, was Finch from Villarica wanted to know if he can take his medication heartburn daily or if he can take it, stop it, restart it again? Is it something like a, like a, like a Plavix that you have after angioplasty where this is something you've just got to take and you've got to make sure that you have it? Or is there any harm to coming on and going off of this over time? Um, so to answer that, if you already have Barrett's, you need to be on medication the rest of your life. There's no question about if your reflux is symptoms are pretty bad, that you're it's affecting your activities daily living, for whatever reason you don't want to have surgery, my recommendation, yes, you got to stay on the medication because we just talked about it. Um, or we haven't mentioned it, but we talked a little bit about it. When the acid gets exposed into the, into the esophagus, not necessarily it's going to cause you a symptom. 
right? Mm -hmm. So you can have exposure of the acid in your esophagus and not heartburn or chest pain, but you had exposure. So that's why I was calling it a silent disease. You not necessarily have that symptom, but you're still having burning of that acid over there. So to answer the question is, if I have a pretty bad reflux, mm -hmm. you name it pretty bad, you know, it happens to me every day or four times, five times a week, I will stay on the medication for good because you want to prevent that constant inflammation in your esophagus so you don't develop all this complication you're talking about. Awesome. All right. And again, I just want to remind everyone, it's not too late to ask a question below. You're welcome to put it in. Even if you're watching this after our live broadcast, go ahead and enter your question. We'll come back to you. We'll write it through Dr. Espinel and we'll make sure that we find out what you need to know. Uh, let's see. Uh, just a couple more questions that I had. Uh, where can someone receive treatment for their chronic heartburn? Where can someone go to see you to figure out what they should do to get this fixed? Okay. So um, I will just tell you usually the normal path that happens. You've got a patient with reflux disease, goes to the primary care doctor, they put you medication. I mean, I have patients that come that 20 years have been taking medication, just getting worse and worse and worse. That's a typical patient that gets to surgery, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but the path would be that primary care doctor you as a patient say, listen, I've been taking medication for five years, three years, 10 years, 20 years. Things are not getting better. I want to be evaluated a little more in depth. The, the, the primary care doctor will refer you to a gastroenterologist. We have a group of gastroenterologists here in, in, in Tanner's system. Uh, very good. They're all good. Uh, and they will do a bunch of testing to confirm that you have reflux disease. They're going to do an endoscopy, which is put a camera down the throat do the biopsies, be sure you're going to have Barrett. They're going to do another testing called uh, Bravo study, BR, like Bravo, B-R-A-V-L. That study, what it is, oh, is, yeah, Bravo, oh, Bravo. Oh. That study, what it is, is they put a little transmitter mm -hmm. in the esophagus through endoscopy, and then that transmitter is going to send signals to a little pager device, you want to call it, and it's going to measure every time that you have a symptom, they see a heartburn or regurgitation, they click a button, and once you click the button, it's going to read the pH of your esophagus. Remember, acid is measured by pH. So that is a very important test because objectively, it can tell that the symptoms that you're having, heartburn, regurgitation, cough, or whatever, is related to acid in your esophagus. So you have to have that test. The other test that it has to be done is called an, an esophageal manometry. Fancy name, fancy name. They're basically going to put a probe in your in your nair, going down into your stomach while you're awake, okay? And they're going to make you swallow 10 sips of water. And what that probe does is actually a transducer. It's going to go over to the cable to the computer. And with that transducer, is going to measure how strong your esophagus or your food pie is squeezing, mm -hmm. right? Because you got to remember, if I'm going to put a valve at the end of the esophagus, this food pie, what is going to be... What do you need to need? You need a good contraction of your food pipe because if I'm making a valve and your esophagus is not contracting, then food is not going to go through it. So that's a very essential test. Uh, and and also, that's an esophageal monopoly? That's manometry. Right? Manometry. Okay. Manometry. So, I didn't think um, I was right. You know, next time we have that, we'll bring those things in here so that you know, uh, you know, the audience can see them. I think it would be very nice to have an endoscope and things like that. Or it would uh, terrify you. But. Yeah, but, <laughs> but we can do an endoscopy in you. Yeah. Anyway, All right. uh, so, okay. <laughs> so so um, those are tests that have to be done. And the last one is called a uh, barren swallow. We make you drink some conch, get some x-rays. And, and we see, you've got to be sure that there's no tumors, anything like that. So you do all that testing through a gastroenterologist. And the gastroenterologist is going to see, oh, yes, this is reflux. You know, we're not missing any cancer. We're not missing any barriers. We're not missing anything. Your reflux is pretty bad. You fail medical management. I just told you 40% of people in reflux with reflux in the United States, medication doesn't work. And they're going to say, all right, next option is surgery. And that's when they come to me. So that's usually the path where they should go. Awesome. And one of the things that I found that's really interesting about um, heartburn medicine, uh, prescription medicine, is that some people have great results from it and no two prescriptions seem to work the same for any two people. I've been on protonics for 20 years and I know people go, I can't take it. It doesn't work for me. But it's, I mean, it really has helped me. So mine's pretty well controlled as long as I behave myself. You know, if I eat Chinese food and two beers and go lay down, then, you know, I'm in trouble. But 
so if you're taking the medication and the medication is having some eff efficacy for you, if it's working for you pretty well, then you may have found something that's a solution, but you need to stay on it, right? Don't, right. don't come off of it because you're going to open yourself up to other complications down the road. But if you're having trouble finding the pill that you want or you just don't like taking a pill every day, that's when we start going down the road to surgery, right? Yeah, in general, yes. So when we do the surgery, we do it minimally invasive. What is my recovery time for something like this? Okay, so, uh, well, we just talked about we had two options, right? The fund application, the links. The fund application, you'll stay overnight in the hospital. You have to do some eating, um, eating habits, uh, change on some eating habits for the first three weeks. Uh, basically, because there's going to be a lot of inflammation from doing your, putting your stomach around it. And uh, I will say that you'll be out of work for a week, uh, max two. And after you change your eating habits for those three weeks, you can go back to regular diet. In the links, on the other hand, it's an uh, outpatient procedure. You come in, get your procedure done, you go home. You actually want to eat regular food with this uh, links. And the reason is because in the implant that is in the crazy scar tissue. So you want it to... You want it to exercise. You want it to exercise. You want it to, it's just like a knee replacement, mm -hmm. right? So if not, the scar tissue is going to get around them. It's going to get too stiff. And they're going to have difficulty swallowing. So in this case, it's the opposite than the fun application. You want regular food. You have snacks every two or three hours. And for this one, out of work for a I week. I like this kind of recovery. Yeah. And then <laughs> this one, you, you are, you're out probably for a week. Same thing. And back to normal. Fantastic. All right, well, we're gonna start wrapping it up here pretty quick, uh, just a few more minutes. I want to encourage everyone again, if you're watching this on the rebroadcast, feel free to leave us a question. We'll get it to Dr. Espinel and we'll get you an answer. If you're looking at starting the journey toward a, a better fix for your heartburn, you're welcome to call the number that's on the screen, 770-214-CARE, 214-CARE, that connects you to our 24-hour physician referral line. You can ask for a referral to a gastroenterologist and get in the system and start getting this fixed start getting this fixed one of the things that i remember seeing about the links procedure was how many people there's a percentage of people who have this done and no longer require medication no longer change their diet is that right that's correct yes so the the, the studies are there for links they got you know studies five years out with links and the numbers that they have is that uh 98 of the people that get a links their regurgitation goes away so for those people who regurgitate feel that water uh, bash in their mouth it's the perfect procedure um around 85 percent of the people will not have any heartburn and around 80 percent of the people that have the links will not take a ppi on a daily basis right they'll have basically sporadic reflux once in a while so numbers are pretty exciting and uh if you if you if you select the right patient for the links, I think it's a good operation. Fantastic. Well, just so you know, we have uh, gastroenterology offices in Carrollton, Villarica, and uh, uh, Freeman that are part of the Tenor Health System that are affiliated with the health system. So you can go ahead and make an appointment at the uh, location that's most convenient to you. Dr. Espinel practices uh, in Carrollton and Villarica, right? right. Yeah. And we're coming to you live from the uh, operating, uh, new operating suite at uh, Tanner Medical Center Villarica. Uh, we opened here in late 2018. And what was this? Just uh, in 2019, we introduced our, right. our friend, the Da Vinci, yeah. right? So here, here in, in Villarica. In Villarica, right. Yeah. We've been doing robotic surgery for a few years in Carrollton. We expanded it to Villarica. So uh, I guess that is... That is all the questions that came in, and that's everything I can think to, to ask. Dr. Espinel, thank you for your time. No, Tony, thank I you very much. It. And I, I want to thank you, everybody out there who's been listening to us. And I hope this is the, this is the first one, but hopefully not the last one. Right. Okay. Well, hope so. Hope so. All right. All right. Well, I hope I didn't make too big of a, a fool of myself. <laughs> and uh, you did fantastic. I appreciate right. it. Thank right. you again. No thank you. Good.